All right. So you just take it away whenever. Um, how do you feel about interruptions for questions? Do you want to wait um, for questions towards the end? Do you want me to ask you questions while you're in the process of everything? No, we can ask questions in the process. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. All right. Well, welcome everyone this morning. Um, we have one of our very own CNM culinary chefs, Chef Carlos. Um, Carlos, can you introduce yourself and give us a little background on how long you've been cooking and what you do here at CNM? Okay. So my name is Chef Carlos Moreno. I am the lab manager here at CNM. Uh, I actually graduated from this program about four years ago. So I'm a, a student graduate from the culinary program. Um, I started here part-time as an instructional technician right when I graduated. So I've been with CNM for quite a bit now. And then I turned into the last specialist. I did that full-time for about a year, year and a half. And then now I'm the lab manager uh, with, here with CNM. Um, my overall background, I used to work at Antiquity. I was there for about seven years. I was a sous chef for four years there. So I have a strong background with fine dining, seafood and steaks, um, uh, fish, lamb, the different cuts, pork, veal, just a bunch of awesome items. I also worked at Matushi's. I also worked at the, the Grove. So I am pushing uh, almost 10 years um, experience in the field. So everything culinary related. I love. So I have a good background. And, um, I'm actually about to uh, graduate with my bachelor's this summer with um, from ENMU. I'm going to be graduating with my bachelor's in applied arts and sciences with a uh, culinary arts concentration. So a lot, a lot of oh. it, but I love it. <laughs> That's a lot. Oh my gosh! And I love antiquities. They are such a little like <laughs> hidden gem in our yeah. you know in new mexico they're such a hidden gem and it's wonderful well thank you so much um for being here and sharing your culinary experience um i am so excited so what do we have on the menu for today okay so today we're going to be making a full entree we have a lot of elements i'm going to talk and cover and get some good tips and tricks so we're gonna so our entree is going to be a pan seared filet we're gonna do it over a brandy uh, mushroom peppercorn cream sauce. And then we're gonna serve it with a um, roasted garlic, rosemary, brown butter, mashed potato. And then I have some sauteed broccolini with some shallots and um, spices as well. So we have a lot of elements. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> awesome. So uh, is the kitchen open for lunch for us to come in <laughs> afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> Make reservations. It's going to be oh, oh, reservations. Okay, that's right. That's right. We still got to be COVID safe. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So okay. um, what do you so, start with first? First things first. So one of the things we learn um, in the culinary field is timing. Timing is one of our biggest elements. And I'm sure a lot of you know about that. So think about like Thanksgiving when we're cooking for the whole family. You start mm -hmm. your ham. And then later on, you start your mashed potatoes, your bean beans, you know, your casserole. So in my mind, when we're cooking today, I'm going to have a lot of timers in my head, we call it. So I have a lot going on. Um, and just to be aware about it, it just makes you a better cook overall, just having time management as a chef and as well as heat control. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit um, more later on as we go. So first things first, I did a little TV magic. I want to talk about our mashed potatoes today. Um, so. That would be the first thing I started just for the time sake today. I did start them, but I wanna talk about the brown butter part. So my mashed potatoes, um, they're done right here. So basically what I did, I think everybody's kind of familiar with mashed potatoes. I peeled them, I uh, diced them up. And then what I did, I put them in water. I brought them to a boil. And then after their boil, I lowered it to a simmer. I don't wanna have too hard of a, uh, a boil on them. So we actually want to simmer them. You get a, a lot better texture on the potato instead of a hard boil. So we want light bubbles basically in the water is what I'm saying. And I cooked it depending on the size of the potatoes. We did like a large dice, a pretty good chunk. So ours was about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, we actually tested it out and see if it was al dente. It was soft with a, with a fork. Um, so that's what we did. So that's there. But what I want to talk about also is um, so the brown butter. So mashed potatoes, 
today. So mashed potatoes itself is such a great item. We can infuse so many flavors. People will add ingredients into it to like a, a green chili, garlic in there, mm -hmm. um, anything really. Today we're gonna do a infused flavor. So this is almost there. And I wanna show this real quick. So brown butter, what, so what brown butter is, is we, we're taking whole butter and we basically melt it down. It's a little warm. I'm going to show you. So this is not there yet, but I want to show you the different stages. Can you see that? Oh, wow. So right now it's like an, a light golden color. Okay. So brown butter, what happens is we basically, we're, we're going to melt it down and it starts caramelizing a little bit with the, with the fats and everything in there. And what it, what happens is when it starts turning brown, you start getting like a nice nuttiness to it. A nice aroma that has a good flavor to it. So that's what we're doing today. And we're gonna actually infuse it. So what I did here was I added my rosemary, my garlic and butter. And what I did, I put this on low, so low and slow. And it is in the recipes that I provided to so low and slow. And basically we're just infusing the flavor. So low and slow until we start seeing the color change. So I'm almost there, it's like a golden brown. But I wanted to show you this. So we're looking for like a nice, it's not burnt, but it's brown. Huh? And how much butter did you use? So right here we used, uh, I used uh, about a fourth of a cup, so four ounces. Fourth of a cup, okay. Yeah. And that, that thing that you pulled out of the pot, what was that? Or what do you do with oh, that? So this, is, so this is, so when I'm saying infuse, I'm not gonna, I'm just extracting the flavor. Oh, so okay. the rosemary, garlic, and the brown butter. And then I'm gonna strain it. So this is a, a small china cast. Oh, okay. I'm gonna strain it so it's in my potato, but the potato is nice and smooth. It has a flavor, just so you're not chewing on the large leaves of the rosemary is gotcha. what I'm trying to prevent. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so that's what we're doing. So I have that there. We're gonna finish it. So I'm gonna put it back on low and slow, and then we're gonna come back to it. I love the smell of rosemary when it's, when you're, you know, using it in the kitchen and oh my gosh, it smells so heavenly. Yeah, I love rosemary. A, a little bit goes a long way. Yes, so, yes it does. So the next things, while well, that's working, so I have my potatoes, the butter is working. Now I want to start talking about some more of my prep that I want to go over. So. The key thing being a chef and a fish in the kitchen is being nice and organized, right? So we call this mise en place. So this is my whole recipe that's nice and measured out. It's already cut. I have my shallots minced. I have my garlic minced, fresh thyme. I have my green onions, my butter, my brandy. And I'll explain this a little bit more as we keep going. I have my veal stock, my cream my mushrooms. So everything here is already cut and prepared. So when I'm actually cooking my entree, I don't have to be moving around much. I could just keep grabbing my ingredients and, and keep um, just time efficient. So again, I have some nice garnishes. So we're going to use some micro broccolini, broccoli, I'm sorry. So that's going to be a nice garnish. And then we also have some nice green onions cut as a, uh, as a bias. And then our side vegetable is gonna be broccolini. So I'm gonna actually show you how to blanch and kind of go over that in a little bit, but here's our broccolini that we're gonna use. See how nice and green it is. So real quick, so next thing we're gonna do is blanch. So what blanching is, is um, it does a couple things. I am, actually, I'm sorry. So I have a pot of water here. And what we're doing is we're basically par cooking it. We're cooking about halfway. We're also bringing out the green color and we're also getting rid of a lot of like maybe fat dirt or if it had some impurities that we didn't want. So you can see the difference. So this is blanched where it's almost, it's pretty soft. Oh yeah, but it's bright and green. Then, yeah. And then here is raw, right? So see the di color difference. Wow. So what happens is when I blanch them ahead of time, it, so it does that, but when I'm cooking, I all, it's going to take me maybe a minute or two to finish cooking. So in the industry, we blanch a lot of our vegetables for time's sake and also to bring out the colors and it, it cooks evenly. Now, instead of putting raw in a pan where I'm going to saute it with oil, it, this is not going to cook correctly than this. It's going to have a lot of, it's going to have a weird color to it. It's going to have a weird bite to it. It's not going to be very good. So that's why we blanch. So basically, 
I have a um, pot of water. I put a little salt, just so the salt could kind of incorporate into the vegetable and bring out the natural flavors of it. <clears throat> and blanching works for like broccoli, uh, cauliflower, asparagus, broccolini, um, a bunch of vegetables that you're cooking ahead of time. <clears throat> ahead of time. So my water's boiling. I have an ice bath, so just water with ice. And basically to blanch, I'm just gonna chop, I put them in the water just for like a minute or two, if that, maybe even less. It depends. This really depends on the size of the ingredient. So the broccolini is pretty thin, right? I'll show you one more time. So think about broccoli, how broccoli is a lot thicker, like trunk. That's right. gonna take a lot longer to cook than these. So these I'm actually gonna blanch for maybe a minute, less than a minute. And what I'm looking for is I don't wanna over blanch it. I don't want it to be mushy. I don't want the leaves to be falling. I want it to be nice and pliable. You can also taste it. If you could eat it, eat it and it has a, a good bite to it, you know it's ready. Okay. Instead of like that raw crunch, if that makes sense. Right, right. So we have more people that are on um, campus uh, needing to make a reservation. So <laughs> I don't know who's taking those, but I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> So again, so now I know I'm pretty much there. You can see the color is nice and green and, and it's pliable, right? So now I'm gonna get my ice water because I wanna stop the cooking process. So we're gonna shock it just to stop it and shock it. And that's the whole process of blanching. So now I'll take it out of the water and dry it off. And then now I'm here and now I can cook a lot faster, right? Okay. Okay. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. I just want to talk about blanching is a great thing. So. And when do you want to do blanching? Do you want to do it like say only for entrees? Do you want, can you do it for let's say a crudite or you know other things? Like when do you want to do blanching? Um, any anywhere where you want to save some time, blanching you can. Use it in a lot of different scenarios, not just for entrees, but you can do it for your, if you're cooking with your family at home, you know, Thanksgiving, a barbecue, you're, you're gonna do some, maybe asparagus on the grill, maybe I wanna blanch them and then put, finish them on the grill. So it just depends. It, you can use it in a lot of different uh, situations, really. Awesome. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have our, our vegetable, we have our potato, right? So now let's talk about our entree. So, so what we're using today is our, our protein here, we're using uh, beef tenderloin. So if we were to wrap this with bacon, that's your filet mignon. But in this case, we don't have bacon because I'm gonna have fat in my sauce. So a lot of times why they wrap bacon is to add that fat, add that texture because um, tender, beef tenderloin is pretty lean. Okay. So that's why people like that. A mouthful that it brings a lot more flavor to it and so here though like it says we have fat in our sauce it's by itself i did salt and pepper this a little ahead of a time i like when it sits there and kind of uh marinates a little bit you can i think it's a great idea to pre-salt your steaks um you know and any spices you could add salt pepper garlic is a great combination salt pepper garlic and onion powder uh anything like that really so here we got two fillets. If you can see that, you see that right? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> okay. that's good. Okay. So, how far, how far ahead do you think you should pre salt it? Oh, how far ahead? Like about 30 minutes is a safe one. Some people do like an hour. Uh, so, like an hour between half hour, 15 minutes before. So, somewhere around there. You don't want to overdo it where you do it like the day before if it's just salt and pepper because it might get absorbed too much salt and it might be a little bit salty. Uh, what temperature you do you want to start with the beef? Um, what was that? Temperature on your beef. Oh, okay. Start, so so when we're, when we're cooking, um, I did pull this out of the refrigerator. These are, it's really good idea to bring them to room temperature for a couple of reasons. One, they'll cook a lot faster and two, they'll cook it evenly as well. 
So a, a lot of places, if you're cooking a lot colder, um, your temperature, your outside might be super seared where it looks beautiful, but then inside might be really cold still. So that's why we bring it out um, to room temperature. So, okay. Then I'm gonna start heating my pan up. So we are building a pan sauce. So notice I don't have like a gravy already made or the sauce is already made. I'm just gonna ladle it on top. We're gonna build this to order. So we're gonna, and I love building pan sauces because you're building a lot of layers of flavor. There's a lot of steps to it. There's a lot of combinations. Um, just infuses a lot of flavor. And you'll see what I mean by step by step. It's not like I throw everything together and put the heat up and then it comes together. I'm actually step by step building my amazing flavors. And also in the meantime, I forgot to mention, I did preheat my oven to 400 degrees. As you can notice, our steak is pretty thick. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna sear it. I'm gonna shoot for like a medium rare. Um, so I'm gonna finish it, sear it in the pan, and then I'm gonna finish it in the oven. And then by the time my sauce is going to be done, my steak should be pretty close, depending on the temperature you want. So for medium rare, it should be uh, right there. But I'm going to kind of play by ear. A lot of elements happen too. Maybe my sauce is going to take a little bit longer. I'm just going to keep in mind, but generally it should be pretty close. Do you have any tips on how to know when it's medium rare as opposed to rare? I love my steak in any like hamburgers and stuff, rare. Most places yeah. won't cook them rare because <laughs> of other issues. <laughs> but I like my I like my steaks mooing pretty much. And so that searing, I love when they do a really good sear on my steak because it just brings out so much flavor. Um, yeah. But how can you tell when it's, do you have any tips or tricks on how to figure out like, what that is because like you said timing could be a little different when you're waiting on something else so how does that work yeah so there's a lot of different there's several um things you can do one the safest one i'll tell you right off of that is um checking the temperature the interior temperature with the okay. thermometer you would want to probe it all the way in the middle and for a rare, you're going to be about 115 degrees to 125. And then from there, it goes up every 10 degrees or so. So medium rare, we're shooting for 125 degrees. Uh, medium is going to be around uh, 135. And then medium well, be like 145. And then um, well done is 150 and up around there. Oh, like, okay. okay. So that's your safest route to take if you're unsure. The other ones too would be... Um, timing and feel. So feel sometimes I would say be careful because a lot of steaks are all kind of different with the different muscles. So, but generally they're pretty similar, but just keep that in mind. So you can actually feel it and feel how much it bounces back. So like a rare would be pretty squishy in the middle. If I were to just like how it is now, it's pretty soft. And then medium rare is gonna have some tension and then medium is gonna bounce back just a little bit and then meeting well, barely, and then well done, it shouldn't. Like a dough, when you're touching dough, how it kind of bounces back, kind of similar concept. Um, and the other one too is timing. So as chefs in the restaurant, we think about how long the timing is gonna take, but we had to think about too, is how thick our steak is. So in this case, again, pretty thick steak, right? If it was like a, a pretty thin steak and I want medium, that's gonna cook in a couple minutes. But okay. if I want medium on a steak like this, this is going to maybe take me like 10, 12 minutes, depending, again, on heat control, depending on how high I have my oven, how hot your grill is, how hot your pan is. So those kind of, um, once you start cooking as you go, you'll start learning the different elements. So that's what we teach students about heat control, heat control. So okay. that's one thing. So um, for medium rare, it's going to maybe take us with this thick like about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes. I'm gonna check it, I'm gonna let it rest, but we're gonna go roughly around there and then we can probe it, check the temperature. So I have my pan, I want my pan pretty hot. We wanna sear it. So what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for it to be kind of smoky. I don't want it to be too smoky where it's, it's smoke is 
rising up, but just you can kind of see it. You'll start seeing it get pretty warm. So with cooking, you use a lot of your different senses, right? So smell, you know, your sight, your touch, all of that kind of stuff. I, oh my gosh, I don't do the cooking in my household. <laughs> I am not that talented. <laughs> But I do enjoy a really good meal, so so much credit to those who love the art of cooking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we are there. We're gonna use a little canola oil. I'm gonna put a little bit in there. You can hear it. I don't know if you hear that or not, but that's what I'm looking for with my sear. And oh wow! Yeah. That's what I want to hear, right? So again, back to senses. I'm I'm listening to the sear. I want to hear that sound. If I if my pan, if I grabbed it and I put it in here, and if you don't hear anything, I know my pan's too cold. There's no way. So I want to hear, like listen to the cooking. It tells wow. when it's ready. You know, listen. And then about how long do you leave it for a sear on each side? Because you you said so, you didn't really want it to cook through, right? So. Yeah, so about like a minute or so, but the real test is visually looking at it. I want to make sure I'm looking for a nice golden brown oh, okay. uh, sear, an even sear, not just half or but I'm looking for that. So it might take like a minute or so. Again, depends how hot your pan is, depends on those elements. But for the most part, I'm looking at it. So I'm searing it. I have oil. I want to make sure my, my oil is moving around. So, and are there particular oils that you want to use for a sear? Do you prefer one over the other? I know, I know there's a difference between like high heat oils and, you know, lower. So mm -hmm. is there something that you prefer when you're using a steak? Yeah, so we tend to use canola oil because it has a higher smoke point. So I could bring this up to pretty high temperature as you can see without burning the oil compared to like your olive oil or something like that. So peanut oil is a good one too, but we usually don't use that in the restaurant industry because of uh, allergies. Uh, oh. Some flour oil you can use, that one has a pretty high smoke point. Okay. Um, so yeah, it does depend. Like I wouldn't use like a coconut oil in here. I wouldn't maybe use a, a avocado oil cooking steaks. Okay. So. Oh, I love coconut oil. <laughs> so, now, I say, now wow. what I'm looking for is that nice sear, right? So I'm going to turn it over. So that was like a minute or so, right? So now turn it over. So that's what I'm looking for. I want a nice hard sear. So again, we were, we're building um, lay, uh, layers of textures and flavors. So I want that nice crust on it. It's gonna enhance the meat a little bit more. You know, we love that nice crunch on the outside or that nice texture where it's not just totally soft. Yeah. In the mouthful, mouth, mouthfeel. So, and I'm also kind of keeping an eye on my, my pan. So I notice it does need a little bit more oil. So things will change. So in your recipe, any recipe, you know, things happen, things change. They're good guidelines, but sometimes if it says like, oh, you need exactly a tablespoon of oil to sear it, maybe you need a little less, a little bit more, and just kind of have to make that call. Things change have to happen in the kitchen. So, by the time, so I know that back to the temperature cooking. So I know by the time I sear my steak, I'm gonna be pretty close to rare. So I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, these are pretty thick steaks. Maybe I'm gonna wait a little bit to put it in the oven while I build my sauce. Um, that's another thing you can think about too. If I'm shooting for like a medium, medium well, I'm like, okay, that's gonna probably take me 12 to 14 minutes, depending on the cut. So I'm gonna maybe sort that right away, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So now we have a nice sear on both sides. Uh, maybe 20 more seconds on that one. In the recipe, I, I mentioned to use like an oven safe pan for your steaks, just because we're gonna finish in the oven. So you don't wanna use like a plate or something like that. So any kind of oven pan um, will work. 
I'm gonna pull my heat off just a little bit. It's pretty hot. So now I have my steaks it's nice and seared, right? Now, another thing too, I know these are pretty rare inside is, we call this the window, the side here. Can we, see, am I too close? Mm -hmm. No, oh. no, no, you're perfect, yeah. So, and this works for a seafood too. That's called the window, the side. Oh my gosh. So you can see that's pretty rare. So that's, that's another thing. That's my steak right it. there. Can I, I'm gonna put my name on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one right yeah. there. So I'm not gonna put an oven just yet. Okay. So I let my, so again, heat control. I don't want my pan to be scorching hot. So I let it cool off just a little bit. I have a decent amount of fat in there, oil. If I had too much, I should probably pull some out because I don't want it to be too fatty. So back to our pan sauce. Now we're gonna start making our, um, our brandy mushroom peppercorn cream sauce. So we're gonna start with the mushroom. So here you can use any kind of mushrooms I have, uh, oyster, cremini, and some buttons, your typical white. So I have a variety, you could just use button mushrooms, you could use portabella, you could use combination, any mushrooms would work. And do you cut them in half quarters? Do you leave them whole? So that depends. I like to cut them, uh, I actually quarter mine and wedge them. Oh, so they okay. give a little bit of better presentation instead of uh, slicing them. And then the oyster mushroom, I left them kind of whole. So th those are oh, nice wow. little shrink too. So just like that. Those you can really slice them uh, like the, the normal way, put them out of bias. And we so have somebody we asking. I'm sorry? Oh, we have somebody asking where you can get cremini. So I don't know if I'm mushroom? pronouncing that right. <laughs> yeah, cremini mushrooms. Uh, yeah. Those, you could get them from Sprouts, uh, Whole Foods will have them, even like Smith's has them, right? Um, I don't know if Walmart does them, maybe something like that. They're also known as Baby Bella, uh, Portobello mushrooms, so they might be labeled. Okay, Albertsons has them, Lowe's has them. Okay, Lowe's, Albertsons, so you just gotta look for them, but they're like the little brown ones. The little? Brown baby ones. Oh, okay, those are like the brownish color, okay. Yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> so they'll, they look like the brown ones. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to put a little bit of little oil, put my mushrooms in there. So again, I'm hearing the sound, right? That's what I want. So when is our culinary division going to invent smell-o-vision? <laughs> can you, can we, we want to smell what's happening because we can hear all the <laughs> stuff and it sounds amazing. <laughs> we need, we need that yeah, ASAP. <laughs> Are you so, still using canola? This is still canola, yeah. I just put a little bit more because it was a little bit dry just because I was talking and that's all. So what I'm doing here, heat control, you hear the sounds. I'm uh, I'm sweating them and browning them. I don't have a high, high heat. I do want to uh, cook them down. So I'm just going to cook them first. Let me see. So I'm going to cook them about halfway. And notice too that generally all my cuts here, minus a couple of little pieces, they're all the same size. So if they weren't the same size, I would have to maybe cook them uh, at different timings. So the bigger ones I would add first. These ones are all generally close to the same size, so I put them all together. So we're gonna put it back on the heat. So we're gonna let this cook for about like a minute, minute and a half. Okay. And so you use the same pan as your steak. Is it because you're pulling the flavors from the steak? What What is the reason behind using the same pan that you use the steak in? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Why you use the same pan? Oh, the same pan. So we're, I'll show you, make more sense. So we're, again, back to building flavor. So you see this right here, this is called the pond. Yeah. Yeah. So when we deglaze it with alcohol, we're actually gonna keep that and incorporate it into the sauce. So like, think of like the meat juices, think about um, like when you do gravy at home, the, the, the juices from the turkey, it's kind of mm. the same concept here. We're incorporating flavors. We're building awesome. layers and layers of flavors. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it's called a pan sauce. So also too, in the industry, think about, I have a I'm busy lunch hour, dinner rush. I'm going to have 
tons of cans going. So I'm going to have to fill them to order depending on the type of restaurant and it's to limit the cans as well, right? So, gotcha. so this is about halfway. Um, now I'm going to add my shallots. And then my garlic as well too. Are you using minced or whole garlic? These are uh, minced shallots and minced garlic. Okay. So we're gonna cook that down just for a little bit. The, the minced garlic cooks very fast, so this step is very quick. I know, I don't like when my, unless I'm roasting it, I don't like when my garlic gets too brown or like that burnt flavor. Right. Yeah, yeah. And again, that comes to heat control, right? So you can see now my garlic and chalice are being cooked down. They're not burnt, they're not black. And that's why I didn't add my garlic and chalice first. I added the mushrooms first. Oh yeah, looks good. And another thing too, so in the restaurant, um, you always learn, we usually have a towel and tongs, like our, our sword and shield, right? <laughs> or at home, you know, that's why I'm using more of a, a wooden spoon to show you uh, home friendly. But what I also want to say too, so saute is a common technique we use all the time. So what saute means is high heat, what we're doing, and then Usually your ingredients, I don't even have a spoon to mix around. I just, just jump, right? I uh -huh. send it, put the food on the rim, and then I'm just, it's a jump, right? Man, that's too fancy for me. Yeah. <laughs> I like, <laughs> that would be everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I'm showing you with the spoon. Okay. So that's there. Now we're gonna add our, um, our green peppercorns. These are like pepper berries. This is gonna add a nice peppery mouthful. They're delicious in our sauce. It's kind of like apwa. Apwa is a very peppery um, encrusted steak and it's a beautiful sauce. So very similar. So these came in a, they come in a can. So they're in a brine. So what I did, I rinsed them because I don't want that brine to affect my sauce too much. I just okay. the peppercorns itself. So we're gonna put my peppercorns in there, toast them just a little bit. So are they hard or are they like um, uh, capers? Like soft uh, capers? Similar to capers. Okay. They're pretty soft. I don't know if you can see that, but. Oh like yeah, oh man. okay. Yeah, so similar like a caper, a little bit smaller. Okay. I'm gonna add my brandy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna deglaze our pan with the brandy. We wanna be careful when we do it. When we pull it off, we wanna pull it off from the pan. So you don't see me, I don't have the whole bottle, right? I'm not gonna just pour it over because it does flare up. You see the fancy kitchen. Yeah, the whole <laughs> thing. Yeah. You don't wanna see me here and pouring with the whole bottle because what can happen is it can actually catch on fire. So, you know, you're like, oh, wow, it flamed. Well, it actually can catch a fire and ignite. And I've actually seen it happen before. Oh. You have to shoot the cap off and it just makes a mess. Dangerous, the whole bottle could bust. You could hurt somebody. So we want to be safe as well. So the, the best route is I put in a kind of some kind of portion cup. Now I took it off the heat. Now I'm adding it away from the heat, right? And then I just put it back on the flame. And then now... Being sick. Nice. Ah. People like to see fire, right? <laughs> yeah, fire. So, okay. So, question about adding alcohol to your food. Uh, I once did, I made a, like a banana foster, and I guess I didn't cook the alcohol out enough. <laughs> so, how long does it take to? Are you cooking the alcohol out or are you using it as flavor? Like what part of the alcohol are you using for the flavor in your food? So we're doing both. We're, we're cooking it out, but we're also infusing the flavor of the brandy. So what brandy. I'm looking okay. for, I want to reduce it. And you notice how the flame went away. So the alcohol, most of it is uh, cooked off, but it's still going to keep cooking out. So what I'm looking for is I'm reducing it. So look how 
in my sauce, it's oh, incorporated. Yeah. And see how it, most of it kind of absorbs, it's reduced, it's inside my mushrooms and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. So same thing with like wine, uh, you can use any kind of alcohol really. You just want to reduce it so it, it concentrates the flavor as well. And then you don't have the alcohol too. So really. Got it. So, so in the meantime, I know my sauce is uh, halfway. I do want to put my steak in the oven. We're going to grab this. Temperature of the oven. My oven is at 400 degrees. So. Awesome. Okay. So we're here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add um, just a tablespoon of butter. Notice I haven't salt, I salted my mushrooms yet. What happens is when you salt them right away, the, since the mushrooms are like sponges, they'll cook down and they'll shrink, but you don't want them to be super concentrated with salt. It would just absorb it, absorb it, absorb it, and you just have kind of a salt ball. So I'm going to salt a little bit later on, just so I could make sure the mushroom, you get more of the mushroom flavor, it's not a salt bomb, right? So, so cooking this down, timing I'm okay? Yes, you're doing good on timing. Uh, we have about a mm, little over 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I do find that when I'm doing stuff, I tend to under season things because I'm always afraid if I over season it, I can't get the saltiness or whatever I'm using out. <laughs> yeah. What's that? So this here is a uh, veal stock. Or, I'm sorry, beef stock. We can use beef, we can use chicken, we can use vegetable stock, anything like that. So we're going to add, I added it there and I want it to reduce at least by half, right? Right. So again, I'm thinking of timings. My sauce is about halfway done. So I'm going to start thinking about heating up my mashed potatoes. I'm going to start heating up my pan to finish our broccolini. Why did you not put the steak in right away to the oven? So the reason why is it's a uh, medium rare. So my timing, I know I'm going a little bit slower than normal because we're talking. So I didn't want to overcook it. So now by controlling the timing, I delayed it so we could finish the sauce and I can always catch up the steak because my sauce could sit. I can't like go back on the steak if I wouldn't cook it, if that makes sense. So that's why I'm just kind of controlling the timing of it. And 400 is a pretty high heat for most cooking, right? I'm used, I'm used to like, well, baking 350 or yeah, 400 is. Um, it, it, timing wise again. So I'm, I work in the industry, so we always have it full blast. And if I have a lot of stuff going on, I'm opening and closing the oven. Um, there's a lot going on, I'm losing the heat. So that's why we cook at a higher temp. And so if it was at 350, 350 is fine. You just have to start it a little bit sooner. Again, back to timing. So today, if I were to clean at 350, maybe I would have started it right away for a medium ramp. So Because then it would, it would technically go slower right because you like you yeah. said you're opening closing and doing all that oh okay yeah. good little trick I like that exactly so building layers of flavor so just keep in mind we seared it we added our mushrooms shallots our garlic we glaze we added beef stock you got chicken again or vegetable stock and we're just building layers of layers of flavor. And that, that's what's going to make this dish so great. And you can see how it went from a liquid and thickening up, right? It's reducing. Mm -hmm. So I love time. mushrooms. I love them. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so now I'm going to lower the heat because I know my steak is working in the oven. I am going to, so I have heavy cream, thyme, and then I'm going to add salt and pepper. So another great thing about cream sauces, again, if my steak wasn't ready, you can always fix the sauce. I can add more cream if it gets too thick. If it's too thin, it just needs time to reduce. So they're good sauces that you can go back and forth. So this one reduced pretty well, as you can see. That's going to be concentrated with flavor. My mushrooms are not burnt. They're nice and cooked down, right? Yeah. So we're going to add heavy cream. So this is about four ounces, quarter cup of a, uh, or half a cup of heavy cream. We're gonna add our fresh thyme that I minced down. 
And then we're going to add salt and pepper. So about a, a teaspoon of salt. Again, the salt level, you can adjust it if you wanted more or less. Uh, some people you know, like less or more. And then black pepper. Fresh cracked. You could use white pepper. If you're using white pepper, I'll go very light. Okay. So now that's reducing. I have my potatoes going. I have a second to kind of think if my station is dirty, I could clean up maybe. If I was at home, maybe put the dishes in the sink and just kind of get ready for our plating. So I was going to say, you cook. I don't know how it happens, but food just ends up everywhere when I try to do my best at cooking. <laughs> Everything looks so, again, organized. I love that. Me some thoughts. <laughs> so my steaks are getting pretty close. Again, my window shows me I'm rare going into medium. So again, if I want to feel it, I should probably be closer. I'm going to probe it. But you can see how it, it bounces back, right? And I have gloves, so I wouldn't touch this if I was barehanded. Um, because this is going this is ready to eat food in a second. Right. And if I don't have gloves, it's like me putting my finger in your mouth like or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> we so don't want now that. We're gonna temp it. When we temp it, we want to make sure we go all the way into the interior. I'm gonna pull that off just for a second. I wanna go all the way in the middle and see what we're eating at. And so you go through the side, not straight down. So now we're about medium rare, right there. So 129 degrees. So 125 to 130-ish, we're perfect, right? So we're going to let our steak rest. Take a drum. Let it rest. We're going to come back here. Now we're going to get ready for our final steps. <clears throat> So we have our sauce, we have our protein. Let's look at our, real quick, look at our mashed potatoes. So here I have, this is just water. It's a double boiler to keep it nice and hot. I don't have it on direct heat or else I'll scorch the bottom of it. mix it around and nice and hot. When I'm serving an entree, I want every single element to be nice and hot. Everything seasoned, delicious. That's what we want, right? Absolutely. Hot food, hot, cold food, cold. I hate to go to restaurants and everything is nice and hot and then you get the potatoes and the potatoes are cold. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. lukewarm, right? Yeah. So of course we're getting close. I want to taste everything. So I want to taste our sauce, see where we're at. All right, I'm going to smell it. Taste it. That's actually beautiful. That's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to taste our potatoes. Mmm, breakfast. Mm. <laughs> Again, my yes. friend. So we know those are ready. Got our pan. Now let's start our vegetable. Our steak is resting. The reason why we want it to rest is so it could really relax and absorb all the juices still. And when we play, we don't want the juices to be flowing on our on our on our plate. So it's called resting. All right. So do you um do you season your potatoes when they're boiling or do you season your potatoes afterwards? So that's an interesting question. There's I like to do both. One is I, I season my water with salt. Some people will season it, they'll add garlic in the water, they'll add onions, and it will just incorporate more flavors. Um, you could do that, but, or even do both after you make the mashed potato, the puree, and then you add your seasoning, either from dry ingredients to, um, to infused butter, like what we did. So our, our starch, I mean our vegetable, we're gonna do broccolini. We're gonna keep it light because everything else is rich. We're gonna do some shallots, salt, pepper, canola oil, and our broccolini, that's it. Okay. This is gonna go fairly quick. So 
the shallots are going to cook quick. All right. And now, I'm going to add my broccoli. Okay. A little bit of salt and pepper. Renee wants to know if you can just use regular broccoli if you can't find broccolini. Yes, of course. That's all my green beans, um, cauli cauliflower, cauliflower, that's all fine. Asparagus. Does that, is this Asparagus. like a certain season for it? Like, does broccolini come out during a season or can you find it? How does, because I don't think I've seen it in the store. Are you getting broccolini? Broccolini? There's a season for it. it it's in, there's a season for it, yeah. What is that one again? Early spring. Like Early spring and, and okay. summer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So again, our broccoli needs are already cooked down. We're just going to heat it up just like that. And now we're going to start plating my sauce. Is there. My last thing for my sauce is a couple of green onions. I'm all about colors and garnishes. So we're going to put them right at the end to give it a nice color. I have all my elements ready. We're gonna grab my plate. Usually I put this in the oven, but since there's so much heat, this is like a nice little hot box. All right, I got my plate. And now we're ready to start plating it. So first things first, let's do our potatoes. So plating, there could be so many different things you can do. It's uh, people ask me this all the time, like how do you how do you plate or like what do you do? And it's just one of those things. It's like painting a picture. You just kind of like start one thing and then you just add another thing and then you just add another. And then you just start building a, sorry, I can't see that, huh? So I'm using a, a remold. Got my potatoes. And there's, you just kind of start like painting a picture. You have an idea of what you want to do or maybe not. You just have the elements, right? So we have my potato. Sauce. We're actually gonna cut my steak out of bias. We gotta share milk. Here. I grabbed the small cutting board on accident. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. So I got my knife. It's been resting, right? So we're gonna be nice and beautiful. We're actually gonna cut this out of bias. You know, I'm gonna wait one second. Let's put the sauce first and then we'll put the so we got my sauce, right? Look at that. Wow. Not too loose, not too thick. Oh good. Nice nappe is what we call it, where it coats back of a spoon, right? So notice when uh, I'm plating, I'm not just like pouring the pan over, I'm using a smaller element. Uh, like a spoon or something like that to control the portioning. So is plating kind of an individual preference of what you put on the plate first? So I noticed you started with the mashed potatoes, like the softer items compared to like your steak and then built that way. Or is there an art to that? Um, it, it's just, there's a rhythm to the plate, right? It's just how you're composing it. Also the elements too of like building from top to bottom. So I know my steak is gonna be my last one. So I'm kind of building these elements first and then gonna put steak and garnishes. So there's just kind of a, you think about it, there's like a rhythm to it, that makes sense. I like that. You know, so I wanna show off the colors, the sear on the steak, um, all of that. So I'm gonna not cover the sauce. I mean, cover the steak into it with the sauce. Right. And we are almost there, All right? So there's that. That's one. Can you see it? I'll move this over. Oh my gosh, that looks so amazing. And then we're going to cut this out of bias. And a bias just means like angled? Angled, yes. Okay. And then now we have our beautiful wow. medium rare, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just to show the interior of it. So we're going to put our steak there. Sit that upside down like that and then our garnishes i think 
so because I admire, you know, all of you in the culinary industry, I was watching um, the, what is Chef Ramsey's show? I think he would approve. <laughs> I think you would, I think you would totally Look at that. that. Oh my gosh. And then there we have a full amazing. entree. So we have our pan seared steak, our mushroom, brandy peppercorn cream sauce, sauteed broccolini, and our brown banana. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. So, okay, being in fine dining, I noticed some of the portions can be smaller. Is there a reason why some portions in some areas are larger and some are smaller? Like, no, so you did a really good portion, um, but why is it in fine dining they seem to get smaller? So, so it, it's it's the more of a experience with the palate. You know, it's not so we feel so stuffed, but it's more to to take your palate for a a journey experience, right? So you taste multiple courses, you're tasting all these flavors, so you can taste multiple things, and then afterwards you could be like, wow, that was great, instead of like, wow, I'm freaking stuff. <laughs> you know? I can't move. <laughs> I need a nap. <laughs> oh, you did so amazing. And look, your timing. We have four minutes left. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, we have a question. What's your favorite go-to thing to cook for dinner? Go-to what? Your go-to dish for dinner. Uh, it's hard. Ramen. Ramen. <laughs> Ramen. Oh, man. Food. You know what? Um, I go with that's a hard one. You know what? Maybe. It's, <laughs> um, that's a hard one. One of my favorite. I love mushrooms, so kind of similar to this dish. I like to do mushroom ragouts. Um, it's because they're oh. creamy. They could go. They're very diverse. You could do it with steak, pork, chicken. They're easy. I usually have all the elements, ingredients in my refrigerator, so that's a very, very um, quick dish. And so, do you still, find that cooking while well, being like in the culinary industry that you always have, what is it, a protein, a veggie, a starch? Like, do you, do you do that in your own personal? Like, do you make sure you have all the elements of a plate? At home, is that what? Yeah, yeah, yeah at home. Like, I do, because for me, when I cook at home, it's me practicing, usually, uh -huh. even if it's something simple. It's like, even if it's like chicken wings, how can I elevate the chicken wings to make it look like awesome? Yeah, <laughs> you know, instead of like in a basket. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but like, how can I change it? You know, so for me, um, I do try to incorporate everything, and it's just a good experience. I love personally when I eat. I like to have my vegetable, a potato, starch, rice, couscous, something like that. Um, so I usually try to. Maybe some days are I probably will be simple and just grill a steak and. That's it, but but typically I usually do a full entree. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share this culinary experience and your skills. Oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> so impressed. Um, we are recording this, so um, we're gonna put it up on the website and we'll share it with your team as well. So that way, if you guys wanna use it in the future for anything, um, I'm gonna check to see if we have any more questions. We got a lot of wow, those are amazing. Thank you so much. Looks beautiful, that's gorgeous. Um, go back. Yeah, it looks like very impressive. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. It looks great. Lucky you guys in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chef Carlo. Yeah, we get it. We get to have a great lunch. You no, know, I'm like so jealous right now. Like it looks amazing. Well, thank you again for you know supporting our um, experience with all of this. And um, I know you're still back this afternoon at C. Those of you who are on, um, we do have another chef from our culinary um, department, Andrea. She's going to be doing an amazing own version. Um, mine always come out hard as rocks. So I'm excited to learn some tips from her as well. So please check us out at three o'clock this afternoon. Um, and again, thank you so much, Carlos. You were incredible. And I love your cooking style. That's so great. Thank you, Carlos.
Have a, take care. <laughs> Bye. Have a great day, Bye. everyone.